Hi friends, um, my name is Bert, you're watching Pastori Time. On your beard there, look in here. Okay. You seem to be sucking up the straw and then dropping it into the thing, which is I'm the just issue. learning how to drink. <laughs> it's all new to me. Um, yeah, I actually I did have when I had my um, uh, chart, um, birth chart, astrology chart reading. Um, I was told that I'm still just learning to be human. Um, that's my journey for this lifetime, and uh, it makes sense. I mean, everything feels new to me. Um, and that you're clumsy. I'm really clumsy. As demonstrated by you drinking that. And I don't know how to drink properly. <laughs> uh, most things confuse me. So, <laughs> still learning to be human in this uh, in this lifetime. Um, it's going well. Um, now, I've had a really weird reading month. I, I think I've been a bit slumpy, but also I don't, I don't actually think it's been a book slump. I think I've just been more interested in other stuff this month. So... Reading has taken a bit of a back seat to uh, listen to music mostly. I've really enjoyed listening to music and watching movies and in generally sort of, you know, life, work and life stuff. So, um, so I haven't read a huge amount. I haven't read any sort of bulky books or anything, but I've read a few to, to talk about. And, and actually, the books that I've read, when now I look at the pile, are quite, quite sweet, really, I think. So um, let's go. The first book I read um, in May was uh, this one. So beautiful. This is um, one of the uh, Boiler House Press poetry collections, which I think are really beautifully put together. And this is Sub Rosa, the Book of Metaphysics by Francesca Lizette. And they have these beautiful uh, editions that come with literally a dead moth inside it. <laughs> Fucking moths. <laughs> this is a poetry collection um, which I. <laughs> From what I could grasp of it, because I, I really enjoyed this collection, although I feel like lots of it um, was slightly um, beyond my grasp. Um, it, it's a poetry collection set in sort of three sections. Um, so I feel like the first section is to do with uh, like a, a, a romantic breakup or the end of a relationship. The second um, collection seems to, the se section seems to be more about um, exploring um, femininity and gender um, and the end section has um, even has some photographs in with it and it seems to be a bit more sort of ritualistic so in in general the collection is um, sort of set out in lots of different formats sort of longer pieces and it has a real sort of um, yeah, ritualistic sort of feel to it, a kind of um, exploration of um, old crafts and folklore and things like crystals and uh, feminine power. Um, it's, um, it's, its use of language was, I just found really enjoyable. So even if I didn't completely grasp the meaning, I just loved the words. And sometimes that's enough, I think, for poetry, like to uh, just enjoy the play of words and this kind of, you know, sort of set off a few little sparks um, for me when I was reading it. And so that was a, a great experience. So I would recommend, I really enjoy all of the Boiler House Press books that I've read. Um, Sophie Robinson's Rabbit is a favourite of mine if you're sort of looking to explore their sort of back catalogue. But um, they're beautiful, really, really great collection of poetry. And I feel some kind of quite sort of vital, young, particularly female voices coming through here as well. So that was good. And then my friend Rob Cherm, um, I've shown this before, sent me a little package and this was included in that. This is Autumn's Sun by Lauren Connors. Lauren Connors is uh, a musician predominantly that I've not heard of, um, who um, played mostly sort of instrumental, sort of minimalist, sort of avant-garde guitar pieces in the, in the 80s mostly. And uh, for a while stopped doing that and uh, wrote this book. Um, so it's largely sort of almost sort of diary pieces um which he wrote it's called time summer through winter 1987 it does have a few other things sort of um before and after that um and place new haven connecticut so it's literally a 
bit of a sort of record of that time in his life. And it's just very beautiful. It's very simply written. It's kind of observations of uh, things going on outside his window, things going on in his house with his wife and his child. Um, um, but thrown in sort of slightly sort of haiku-esque kind of little bits, which are lovely. Um, so yeah, I found this kind of really profound in its sort of simplicity and in the way that it just captures those sort of passing moments that we don't always place a lot of value on. Um, but those are the kind of the moments that we all share, I guess, in a way. So yeah, this was a great find. Thank you, Rob. Um, and this is on um, Blank Forms Editions, who um, are also a great publisher, a little indie press that make really beautiful books. So do seek out their um, their website. I'll add the um, links below for both of these presses because they're both really, really good. Um, okay. Next up, I read another poetry collection, and this is um, Revising the Storm by Jeffrey Davis. This was great. I really, really enjoyed this collection. Um, when was this from? This is his debut collection, so I know he's written uh, others since. This is from 2014. Um, and yeah, these are sort of poems that um, are sort of very personal poems. Um, a lot of them are about his father, but overall they sort of seem to sort of explore the uh, black male experience um, and uh, explore the sort of the family network that he um, had. So like poems about his mum, his dad, and uh, sort of progressing into, I guess, I think him being a father towards the end. Um, so they're great. Um, it's a really good uh, recommendation from Terence Hayes at the back. And it's also uh, got a forward by Dorian Lux, who is a poet that I've been sort of really meaning to uh, look into more since my mate Owen uh, keeps raving about it. So that's kind of how I found this book is through um, the forward. But uh, yeah, this is great. Um, so his father um, was an addict um, and a lot of the poems are de dealing with that kind of um, experience growing up. Yeah, maybe I'll just read you uh, a poem from it. Shall I do that, Shani? Yeah, yeah, this is a nice wrap-up. This is a nice wrap-up. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, this is, uh, this is not one about his father. So there, as I say, there's a lot about his father being um, like a crack addict as well as a sort of an alcoholic. But, um, I really like this poem. This is a meditation at a Pennsylvania diner early morning. Um, I order cranberry juice with my over-easy eggs and wheat toast, an impulse that lingers from my ex-wife's concern for my body and what it could not hold forever. What does it mean to name this moment Concord? With thousands of miles, free ranges of mountains and a merciless silence between us, let this drink order simply bless this morning headed west. Her way, still fat with possibility. My way to smile seems convincing enough. She's kept my coffee warm and the toast arrives unburnt. Yes, just kids, we failed utterly to span that great domestic divide. We didn't have a chance, but I applaud those two for staying in it until the house burned to the ground. And now, if only for her ghostly part in ensuring I have enough cranberry juice to wash it all down, I wish her 100% of her daily vitamins when she wakes. A healthy portion of phytochemical nutrients and antioxidants. Glasses of juice so fresh she could sing of a deliciousness to this world. I refuse the false concentrate this diner uses to become some dark hearkening to our misplaced faith in the deep red promise of wetland blossoms. We have every spring to recover, to gulp the aroma of blooms, lungs filled with the spectral sweetness of fruit we will never eat. Yeah, I was thinking maybe like uh, cranberry juice from a diner isn't the healthiest drink anyway, but maybe it is. I like a bit of cranberry juice. I mean, yeah, it's all right. It's probably yeah. all right, isn't it? It's got sugar in it. It's got sugar in it, but uh, <laughs> otherwise... <laughs> well, it's not good for you. Yeah, let's see if I can drink <laughs> without spilling. I have to hold the... The story's a bit short. Oh, learning. Learning, learning human. every day, learning a little bit more. Next up, Eurovision took hold of our lives and in our themed reading around Eurovision, which for me didn't go well. Um, we were reading uh, translated European queer fiction alongside watching the uh, Eurovision. So I only managed one book. I gave up on my second one, not because it was bad, but I just wasn't in the mood. Um, but I did read this. <laughs> um, the skin is the elastic covering that encases the entire body by Bjorn Rasmussen, 
translated by Martin Aitken. Uh, so this was initially published in Danish, from Danish, De Denmark. Um, I uh, I didn't like this book. This is not uh, this is not a book I enjoyed reading. This is a it's a uh, I guess a hmm, queer coming of age I guess or looking back kind of a novel um, uh, about. A very young guy in his sort of teens who has an affair with a much older guy. I say affair, but it's actually a sort of a, a bit of a power dynamic in which it's closer to abuse than a sort of, you know, a, an actual relationship. Um, and so, yeah, this is a damaged protagonist. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, I don't, uh, it's a lovely book though. Look at that. And the size is really nice. It's the same size as my face. And uh, it's a slightly smaller than my face. And you've got a small face. Yeah, and it's nicely sort of brown, yeah. like my skin. So, I mean, if you are really drawn to this, you might like it. The comparisons to Maggie Nelson are not accurate. Then I read Pizza Girl. Yay! Yeah! Yay! Yay. Um, this is by Jean Kyung Fraser. And uh, this was... A super fun read it was a quick read an easy read um but i found it had lots of depth to it i thought the writing was great um especially for like a debut novel it just felt really accomplished it had that sort of um you know sort of millennial um damaged female protagonist going on uh she's a pizza girl she's pregnant she is i think suffering from a kind of um disassociation almost or she's she's not feeling how she thinks she should be feeling in her life so um it's a kind of a small narrative um and i quite like that it's quite sort of um real um i think and maybe until like right at the end where it goes a little bit sort of uh, story like it was a good time um it has a real humor to it and a uh, sort of that sort of dark um yeah uh, sort of edgy humor which I really like, um, it's sort of comparable, I guess, to like Otessa Moshfeg and uh, that kind of, you know, um, Melissa Mary, Broder, that kind I of thing. I felt Mary Gates skill. Mary but... Gates skill. Yeah, but also, yeah, so it had that that mix of um, pain and um, a bit of hope as well, which I like. Um, so, yeah, it's a good read. I would recommend you read it. It's a quick read. So... Um, yeah, I'm really glad I finally got round to it. This is one of my um, T 2021 uh, TBR books, I think, that I set for myself early on in the year. So, done. Then I read Hit and Run by R.L. Stein. This is a point horror um, from the year 1992. I was 13 when this came out. Uh, and this was a gift from... My good friend, Rebecca, in uh, Carlisle, um, she sent this to me because she saw it in a charity shop and it had a book plate in the back and it belonged to a Sean, Sean Robertson. And Sean actually had, my Sean, had, the, yeah. had these book plates yeah. when she was little, yeah. little whippersnapper. But Pro she didn't have any point horror. Probably in 92 though, you would have been using those plates. Yeah. Yeah, but she didn't have any point horror. So this is Hit and Run. This is about a group of kids, um, wacky, wild, wacky kids that go on a, uh, like a joyride almost. They, they don't have their driver's license yet. They've got their tests coming up. And um, one of the kids in particular, Winks, is just a right knobber. He's like, <laughs> Winks. yeah, he's like really into like practical jokes and all this uh... stuff. And he keeps picking on Eddie because Eddie's a little bit sort of fragile, a bit sensitive. He gets picked on a lot. So Cassie <laughs> is the only girl in the group. She is the only sort of almost like decent human being in this group. And, you know, they go on a, a kind of a, a ride. They're testing out, uh, you know, their, their parents' car. And they hit someone. He's dead. They check this guy on the road. Okay. He's dead. They all panic. Very similar to um, I Know What You Did Last Summer scenario where they're like, this is going to ruin our lives. We don't have licenses. We've killed someone. Let's just pretend it never happened. So then they sort of go off back to their lives and they start receiving like phone calls and notes. 
saying, you know. I'm the dead guy, I'm coming back to get you. I'm right, to I'm coming back. You. I'm the dead guy, coming back to get you. So they all start shitting themselves, and it, it's uh, it's fairly predictable <laughs> where, it's, where you know, who's responsible for it. Anyway, very, very good. I, I feel proud of myself that I did guess the culprit and, you know, the, the ending. So I had a real sense of achievement as well as uh, as well as fun, a uh, fun time. Because Brett never guesses. I never guess. I'm really bad at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And also took me back to the days when I was also sort of um, driving my parents' car before I had a licence. No, travel to Milton Keynes in the car. The car broke down at a roundabout once. All my friends in it, no license. We had to push it up the road and we saw a police car and we, we got away. Hit and run. Well, it wasn't a hit and run. <laughs> no, no one was hit. <laughs> it was just a run and run. Yeah. A stop and run. It was a stop and run. Yeah. Okie dokes. Uh, okay, next up, I had another poetry collection. This is uh, Chlorophyllia by Maria Sledmir. Um, and this is on um, another really great small press. This is a small press that is um, based in uh, both Scotland and Canada, I believe. It's like a joint venture, and it's called Orange Apple Press. So they make these beautiful little um, poetry editions, pamphlets. Um, and Maria Sledmere is a poet that I sort of read quite a bit of, sort of online, and I really like her work. So I ordered this for myself to read. It's got lovely, it's even got lovely um, kind of uh, green staples. If you can see those. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, this is a, a, another really sort of great collection been written through the pandemic because um, it's got that real sort of sense of, I guess, sort of dislocation and sort of distance from people. It's There's a lot of um, stuff about the internet and sort of Zoom um, on there, but it's, it, it's, it's a very sort of playful... Um, quite sort of mystical collection as well. Um, po poetry that sort of maybe sort of might require a few sort of reads to sort of get uh, bits out of and get sort of meaning out of. Um, but I really, really like that. I like um, I like challenging poetry. And um, the uh, last po poem in here, which is called Poke, I particularly loved. I thought that was brilliant. And yeah, Poke, as I imagined when I was reading it, uh, was confirmed at the end that it was a reference to uh, uh, the Poke is after a song by Frightened Rabbit. Um, so do you know the song Poke by Frightened Rabbit? It's really good. Um, so yeah, references to that in there. And I like all the references to, you know, sort of um, internet sort of uh, culture and stuff like that, peppered throughout, uh, mixed in with, um, I guess, more sort of abstract ideas and things like that. So yeah, this is a great collection. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, so yeah, again, I will link um, Orange Apple Press below. It's really good to support these little uh, Little little labels, labels, publishers, and record labels. Buy music. Don't don't stream it. Buy music. <laughs> Bandcamp. <laughs> and then finally, I um, read a uh, an, an audio book uh, called uh, "One Night in Georgia" by Celeste O. Norfleet. This was great. I really enjoyed this. So. Um, I listened to this through the month and I sort of finished it on uh, the 31st. Uh, and this was a, it's a sort of contemporary novel, but it's set in the late 60s, 1968, I think. And it's about a road trip by um, these three black girls um, to, through, um, through America, really, to go back to college. Um, and it's about the racial politics of that era um, told almost through, you know, this, this journey of these three girls on a road trip. Um, uh, so, yeah, as they travel, we sort of get a glimpse into the, you know, the horrors of being a black girl in certain areas of America at that time. And I thought it did a really, really good job. It was um, quite a harrowing read at times, but it was also sort of quite sort of, um, it's quite sort of fizzy, quite sort of um, buoyant. Um, I really like the, the characters, the three girls, and they have like a, a chaperone which sort of joins them, a guy called Daniel, I really liked him too. And the main protagonist, Zelda, was um, is a sort of really sort of politically conscious young woman who, uh, as you know, her other friends are less so, or sort of various degrees of being 
less into the whole sort of idea of uh, black activism at the time. But so the main character Zelda, sort of, we kind of see it through her eyes, and she's wonderful. She's she's so great. The writing was good. The um, the narrator was brilliant for this. So the audiobook, highly recommend. Um, but yeah, so uh, yeah, so as they travel, they sort of uh, meet various law officials um and they get into scrapes they get into some really harrowing situations um and yeah it's a it's a it's a it's, a, it's a quite a powerful read um i hadn't heard of it before so i'm really glad i found it on audio um and yeah uh it has sort of a i think a nicely done sort of romantic storyline um which pro sort of progresses through it as well and I just felt it was a really good insight into the times. You know, there's lots of sort of talk about uh, Motown and uh, so the Daniel character sort of looks down on Motown whilst Zelda really loves Motown and uh, and sort of the racial politics of the era, which is done really, really well, uh, really non sort of um, pandering as well. So, yeah, highly recommend. That was really good. Um, and... That's it for books that I read. I'm reading quite a few books on. I have a few, quite a few books on the go at the moment, so I thought I'd show you those. That'd be all right, Shani. Yeah. Yeah, you okay? Yeah, I'm trying to find my Anna Harper book club book, which I just don't know where it is. Hmm. So, currently reading, um, what's it called? Deadlock by Sarah Paretsky. This is the second book uh, of the V.I. Wachowski series. Um, I'm going to have to see if I can seek out this film with Kathleen Turner playing V.I. Wachowski because I think that would be really good. Have you seen it? Should I watch it? I'm really enjoying this one. Uh, I really enjoyed the first one too. This is a series that I, I think I will be sort of progressing through. This is about um, Wachowski's cousin, uh, Boom Boom Wachowski, who died. He was a world-renowned uh, hockey ice hockey player who uh, sort of retired because he had an injury and he's been working on the docks. And he slipped or was pushed and died um, whilst working on the docks. And she's investigating. Uh, so there's lots of stuff about uh, ships and, <laughs> you know, paperwork to do with... Uh, you like that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I don't really like that. But I, but I really like the character of Vyla Um she's, she's, she's really fun to sort of hang out with. And uh, they're really well written, these. So, uh, yeah, reading that one. Also, and we have one month to go on this, stars in my pocket like grains of sand. This is uh, Samuel R. Delaney, um, which I'm just just about halfway, maybe just over halfway through of this. Um, I really love that Amanda's been describing this as an ambient reading experience because it's over three months. So I'm reading this as part of the uh, Queer Futures uh, book club um, hosted by Butch Poetics. Um, and this is a great book. I'm really enjoying it. I'm really enjoying the process of slowly um, inhabiting it for three months as well. So uh, I need to finish this um, at some point over the month. Um, it's fascinating. It's uh, it's fascinatingly paced in that uh, it doesn't do any of the sort of traditional novelistic things in terms of pacing. It sort of really focuses on something for a long time and then it'll just sort of quickly move on to something else. And um, also, uh, there's very little um, definitive sort of gender throughout the book. It's impossible to sort of, you know, identify uh, which characters are, you know, what, what gender they go by or what gender they are. And uh, I really like that. It's almost quite, sort of a, quite a freeing experience not to sort of visualise them in any sort of specific way. It's so, so minutely creating this world um, that that you feel like you're sort of almost entering it and it's okay not to know everything because it's it's like it's so established that we're not being told everything which is kind of quite nice so you're sort of going into it like this is a real like i'm reading a book from a real place that I'm, i wouldn't know necessarily about um and i'm sort of picking things up as i go along so i'm really liking this this is a really good book um i'm also reading uh the collected poems of ted berrigan um, so this is obviously massive, um, and yeah, you know, I've read a good chunk. The really early poems I wasn't massively uh, fussed on, but where I'm at now, which I think is, where are we now? Mid-60s, I think. 
late 60s. Um, I'm really, really enjoying uh, the language of them. They're sort of kind of quite sort of New York uh, style. Um, Frank O'Hara, I think, is huge in the uh, influence. But there's also that sort of, um, you know, Joe Brainard, uh, Richard Brotigan kind of influence throughout. Uh, I'm also reading The Flip, uh, Jeffrey J. Kripal. Um, this is uh, fascinating, actually. It's really, really interesting. Um, I don't think the writing is sort of lifting it sort of above, uh, you know, outside of like, if you're, if you're not interested in the subject, you're not going to sort of be sort of won over by the writing, if you know what I mean. It's interesting because he's talking about um, how through time, our sort of view of the world has um, sort of flitted between almost like the sort of Platonian and the Aristotelian views um, of, I guess, like of reason and sort of mysticism and how we're very much in this sort of uh, science based reason um, era and how we have been for a long time and, and how it's so established that it's actually that's all that we see of as that's reality now. So he's sort of challenging our views of reality as um, not necessarily something that science can always explain. And yeah, he's doing a really good job of it. So um, a lot of it is based on um, experiences that people have in extreme states. And he's um, using that theory to sort of say that once, to, like anything, like he sort of uses the theory of, like, of water, um, how water it just appears to be water, but actually it's these two... Um, uh, elements, two elements combined, and it's not until you put water under like huge amount of pressure that it separates, uh, you know, into the, that you can still see that it's it's made of actually these two different elements. So actually, sort of life is a similar thing that it sort of appears to be one way, but actually, in in uh, conditions of extreme trauma, often we sort of break through that veil a little bit and we see that there are multiple levels. I think that's what he's saying. Finally, I'm still reading You Know What You Could Be by Mike Heron and Andrew Grieg. I'm on the Andrew Grieg section of this at the moment. I'm really enjoying Andrew Grieg's writing, actually, and he's um, it's quite charming. He's sort of writing about being uh, a young guy in his teens who discovers the incredible string band and who goes with his mate, goes on to form a uh, sort of similar band called Ferret and Fate, Fate and Ferret and how they uh, you know, kind of go hitchhiking and play in some Scottish pubs and, and then go back to school and stuff like that. So it's kind of, kind of charming, kind of coming of age around the experience of listening to the incredible string band in 60s Scotland. Uh, so yeah, I'm really enjoying it. His writing is lovely. I have marked a few bits. Maybe I'll sort of show you a, sort of a, a bit of an example of stuff. Do you know the incredible string band at all? Go and listen, go and listen to them. They're, you know, they're good. So Robin Williamson is a huge hero of mine. Robin Williamson, who's the other guy in the Incredible String Band, other than Mike Heron, although their um, their respective partners will also sort of join the band as well later on. So Licorice and, and uh, Rose. Um, uh, unbeknownst to me, moving to Cardiff, um, Robin Williamson uh, lives nearby, and I see him around town quite a bit. Um, often with a little bit of backpack. He's got his long white hair. I think he's kind of chief druid of, of Wales. I'm not sure if he still is, but he plays sometimes in the sort of little cafe around, around here. I haven't seen him play, but um, I, I have bumped into him a couple of times in sort of co-op and, and bean freaks. <laughs> and um, Sean did make me at one point go up to him and say, you know, which I wouldn't normally do, but I did go up and say, hi, Robin, I'm a, you know, a really big fan of your music. It means a lot to me. And he was a very gracious, lovely guy. And it's an absolute joy to see Robin Williamson around. Um, like I often say, it's kind of like seeing, you know, Dylan or Joni Mitchell in, in, in the co-op or something like that. For me, it's that to that extent. So what an absolute joy. Anyway, um, it says here about Robin Williamson, the word shaman hovers ready to descend like a mantle on Robin Williamson's shoulders. One who alters reality in the group by altering it in himself. Mike less so. There was always an element of earthiness and monkey mischief and human emotion in him. He was having too much of a good time to be an out-and-out -out shaman. It was a given that the point of being there for the four people on stage and the thousands or so around them was to get higher, to alter our reality, to be transformed. It is a very big ambition, way beyond mere entertainment, but it was fulfilled that night, so this is about when he goes to see them live. 
they have their dog on stage, which I really like. They sort of just kind of roll out a carpet. They come on stage. They roll out a carpet. Yeah, like on the, onto the <laughs> stage. Their, their dog comes on, and there's you know, um, it crystallised my sense of the point of performing arts, music, theatre, dance, even poetry readings, and to a degree, even the point of a book. Though they only address one reader at a time, I hope still for words to uncoil off the page like incense to pass along the neural pathways of the brain to alter and alert it. Give me back the world, return me to myself, turn me on, set me loose. I really liked it. So I think the writing is really great. Um, so yeah, that's an ongoing book as well. So yeah, sorry, um, this is quite a long video. I will edit to cut it down. You got some questions? Yeah. What's the best concert you've been to see? I'd love to hear and chat about uh, gigs since we you know it's been such a long time since we've been to any. Do you think, how many levels do you think there are? I remember watching um, Of Reality. Uh, I remember watching a, 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 I think it's in the Beatles anthology where um, Paul McCartney takes LSD at one point and he sort of, at one point he sort of says how he just got the answer, he knew the meaning of everything and he wrote it down he said to his mate you know give me a bit of paper and a pen quick and he wrote it down and then like the next day he sort of woke up and he sort of had this bit of paper on him and he opened it and he looked and it and said there are seven levels <laughs> are there seven levels what do you think um i don't really understand levels no what do you think of that do you understand levels <laughs> We're not sure. Uh, thank you so much for watching. I hope you're feeling good. I hope you're feeling confident in yourself. I hope you're um, not feeling any sort of pressure to enjoy if you're in, in a sort of summer area, because I know some some of my friends in Australia are just going into winter. I hope you're feeling good about the summer. I hope you're feeling good about the winter. I hope you're feeling like body confident <laughs> as we go into <laughs> into these seasons. Um, are you feeling body confident? Yeah. yeah. Let's accept ourselves as we are and just say thank you and <laughs> love you. Bye-bye. <laughs>